culture in recent years. And um, I, I, I always seen like now in music video stuff that people are using these cameras, so you can actually make money and make a career. As I kind of am on my part with my YouTube channel doing so, because I enjoy using them, and obviously it just shows that people are still enjoying them to this day. Max Ballard, founder of the Camera Nostalgia Ch Club channel on YouTube, and Joshua Waller, online editor, also photography magazine. Thanks both. Thank you. Thank you. A report by the stock research platform Wall Street Zen found that six out of ten videos on TikTok about buying stocks and shares are misleading. Now, TikTok is full of posts about budgeting, savings and investments, big banks and finance companies around there. It is also full of get rich quick offers for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and for courses that promise to teach you how to quickly make a million. Anyone can set themselves up on TikTok as a financial influencer. Ash Thapa is a financial influencer and content creator who has over 300,000 followers on TikTok. That's one of the highest for a UK financial educator. Um, Ash Thapa, tell us then what you do on TikTok. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, so, on TikTok, it's just really, you know, making videos about personal finance and some sort of tips that I think would have helped me along the way when I was younger. So, it's just kind of spreading that message and breaking down more complex topics into something simple that everyone can understand. Well, you put us in touch with one of your followers, Molly. She has mm -hmm. followed your tips and she says it's been great for her. She's 21, she earns 20,000 a year, she lives with her parents and she manages to save 200 pounds a month. So Molly now has 4,000 pounds invested in the S&P 500 fund. Um, I had to look that up, but it's a fund that tracks the top 500 companies on US stock exchanges. I spoke to Molly this morning and she told me how she got started. Basically, I just wanted a way to make money work because I know there's a way to make more money without I just want to my money be able to grow with the inflation so I was looking up ways to do that and that's when I discovered the S&P 500. What's that? The S&P 500 is a stocks and shares ISA kind of thing. It goes up and down so sometimes you get more interest, sometimes you get less but it's like one of the most popular investments. So it's very safe because I'm not always really, really investing in like all of what I thought we were going to but because it's 500 different companies it's risky. How much did you have to invest? Well I actually did a bit more than that. I invested about 200 pounds so not loads but yeah I've been doing it for about four years now so yeah it's quite good. And how much you already done under that investment? Right now I've got 600 pounds more than I invested. I've got 600 pounds um, you know, from the investment. Tell me about how you went on, how did you find this, you know, this tip to invest with this particular ISA on, you know, why go to TikTok? Um, I don't know, I think everyone got a bit mad on TikTok, you know, during lockdown, we were all just like, what do we do? Yeah, and I just found a um, really, like, interesting TikToker, and yeah, he just seemed very reliable and the things he was saying. So that's Molly, and I'm sure the interesting TikTok that she's talking about, she, I didn't know what the S&P 500 was, but she calls it an ISA type thing. It's a kind of trap that was in the stock market in America. Did she find out about that from you? Um, I mean, I'm sure she, she must have seen it before as well, but uh, we definitely had some chats just to kind of educate um, more about what it actually is, and you know, obviously the risks behind it, and um, how to go up about setting up or how I would have set it up. Um, so yeah, we, we had a chat of Instagram and uh, hopefully that's helped her. So you moved off the, she found you on TikTok, but you moved off there onto Instagram and you exchanged some messages with her there? Yeah, just because on the TikTok platform the messages, um, like the messaging part wasn't that um, easy to use as on Instagram. Ash, how do you make money yourself? Are you sponsored by anyone? Are you selling anything in that sense? Um, no, I don't really sell anything as in like a course or you know, some sort of program, but it's more so when I'm working with brands, um, like for example, recently did a campaign with Matt West um, about you know, educating more young people um, to actually get into learning about their personal finance. So through that and sponsorship deals, that's the main way of income for me. And do you divide 
where your income comes from, from the advice that you give, because that's the problem, isn't it, with this kind of informal type of teaching. You know, the whole industry was regulated because people were giving advice <clears throat> because they were sponsored and they were getting, you know, they were getting a cut. Yeah, no, so I, I really, um, I'm wary of that, so I, I wouldn't promote or do a campaign that I don't trust or believe in or something that I'd use. So obviously someone like Nat West, um, I actually use them as, as my bank as well, so what they're trusted, I believe in what they do, and I always do a check on the campaign, and it's like, okay, if I would listen to it or I don't believe in it, I would have put it out to my audience because I mean, that's just not right. But you might be recommending a NatWest product and you were in the pay of NatWest and there's something they do employ you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think the companies are wary of kind of promoting products in that sense as well. But I think, so the campaign with NatWest, it was more about education. They were promoting education more than an actual product, right? So it was just through NatWest um, that was happening. So. Okay, I don't feel like it was, yeah. I understand. Let me bring in Amar Rokhavina. He's a qualified financial advisor. He's the managing director of a company called CFP Financial Planning. And Amir, what do you make then of the emergence of so much money in investment advice on TikTok? Thank you for having me, uh, Winifred. Uh, and, and just to clarify there, uh, the CFP qualification um, is uh, a qualification that I have. It is the gold standard for financial planning qualification in the UK and in fact globally. Um, I run my own financial planning practice based in Kingston and Contempt. Um, that's called strategic wealth. Planning. I see, sorry. That's but my no, no problem at all, just to clarify that. But to your point, because I think this is a really, really interesting conversation. So let's just set the scene right. If you look at the tag uh, or hashtag personal finance on TikTok, it has generated more than 10 billion views. Right? So you couple that with the fact that for a lot of the younger generations, this is the first financial crisis, cost of living crisis that they're actually living through. And the fact that these algorithms on these platforms, Instagram, TikTok, etc., are really clever at putting random content in front of people that they wouldn't have searched for before. That's the perfect storm for a lot of good to potentially happen around financial literacy. But also, as you suggested there, a lot of potentially harmful and bad habits to be formed around get rich quick schemes as well so if we draw a line between what regulated financial advice is and what financial education financial ed uh, literacy should be um, as long as people are aware of that line and financial educators feel that they have a pathway to signpost people to regulated financial advice when they see the questions coming at them going that way then i think a lot of good can be done Obviously, young people aren't getting this education at school. That's why they're searching for it on social media. And if providing we can help the nation get more financially literate to make good financial habits part of their life as early as possible, then I think it's a positive. But there is always that danger there. There's always that danger that someone will get incentivized to sell something that is, either, that is not in other people's best interest. That sort of FOMO, that fear of missing out comes in and then people start parting ways with their money trying to get rich quick and unfortunately all they do is they lose those hard-earned pounds and pounds. When we talked to TikTok about it, they said that they are doing what you suggest, you know, pointing people um, to good quality financial advice. So they say that when you search FinTech or any related hashtag, the site will direct you to its safety centre and I, I went on there this morning, it's got lots of links to free reputable financial education resources and information on how to spot scams and how to report them. I mean, what do you think about that? Is that enough? I definitely think that's a step in the right direction and, and, and I love to hear when um, uh, these social media platforms are making people aware that there is bad content on their platform and they should you know, they, they should be smart about who they're listening to. If someone goes on to a, so, uh, a, a social media platform and just re receives information that's thrown at them by an algorithm, they, they don't bother to Google that person or to do some due diligence on their credentials and blindly go doing what that person is saying. Frankly, I think the responsibility is as much on the viewer as it is on the creator. And Winifred, this is nothing new, right? For years, we've been able to walk, walk into a bookshop and, and go into a self-help section and pick up a self-help book around personal finance or around 
healthy eating habits, etc., etc. So um, caveat emptor, I think, applies here. The viewer needs to have discretion around uh, who they are listening to, who they're getting information from. Do your own due diligence, check out people's credentials, and you know, just try to really understand the fact that good financial habits, good education, the doing the boring things without getting bored to build the foundations of a good financial life, that's great. And you can probably pick that up on your own and really build that habit into your life. What do you think Paul Mark is doing with the 200 pounds in the cell? Because she's doing more to save that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Hats off. What she's doing with it though, she's put it in the S&P 500. Exactly. Now, look, I, I, I probably don't have a comment on Molly's situation in particular because I don't know what her overall financial position is, but just the fact that she is proactively looking at her monthly income, understanding that there's a budget there, probably of surplus income, that she can afford to put away for her future self, and having a basic understanding that if she leaves that in cash, it probably won't keep up with inflation over time, and therefore she's chosen a particular product that will give her exposure to some of the great companies of the world, that's not a bad thing. However, you can notice in Molly's um, answer to your question there as to what is the S&P 500, that there's, there is an element of lack of financial understanding on what that but it's hard, actually. all this stuff, isn't it? It's, it's hard. I didn't know what it was. I probably should know what it is. Um, Ash, do you worry about some of what you see from, on, you know, from financial influencers on TikTok and on some other social media? You must. Yeah, no, definitely. I think you've got to be really careful with, you know, what people put out there. And, um, as mentioned as well, it's like, it's up to you to kind of go and do that further research as well and not just take everyone's word for it. 100%. Yeah. We don't want to do it. We want someone else to do it for us. Yeah, no, it's like that, that's the kind of the whole reason yeah. I started, right? Just to make it yeah. easier, but it does, you can only do so much, especially if you're not like an actual qualified investor or, or an actual advisor, right? So it's like, okay, cool. Just point them in the right direction and hope um, that you know, they actually do their research as well. Ash Thapa, Amir, Rock and Pina. Thanks both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, there is such a serious shortage of NHS dentists across the UK that there are reports that some people are travelling abroad to Turkey now for emergency treatment. And even with the travelling costs, it can, it seems, be cheaper to do that than to pay for private dental treatment here. We spoke to some people in Manchester City Centre about access to an NHS dentist. I've not been to a dentist for 20 years, mainly because I can't afford it, I'll be honest. You know, you try and find an NHS dentist, and when you do find one, they've got no places. So what's an alternative is to dip into your savings and, and pay for it, and it's not cheap, is it? And would you ever consider going abroad for treatment? No. I know that is a, an option, but no. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it abroad. Why not? Why would you trust it? Yeah, I know some people consider that you can go away for a week and you, you get a holiday at the same price as having your treatment. I just don't trust the standards in other countries. I've had a dentist ever since being a child, so I've not struggled at all right. If you did struggle at all, would you ever consider going abroad for treatment? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, actually, yeah, I would. Well, we are very lucky got a National Health Service dentist, so but in the past we've had to chop them back. Would you ever consider going abroad for dental treatments? No, no. not no. at all. I mean we know people who've done it, we have a good friend who went to yeah. Turkey and had a load of work and all that. He's been okay hasn't he? Well, at the moment, if they have a problem, you know, it's a long way There's to go back again, you might, as well, you might as well pay, and you've got the fare to pay everything to get there, and a hotel, and you might as well pay a monthly fee to a private dentist. So some people in Manchester talking to Josie LeVay about private dentistry abroad. Paul Woodhouse is a board member of the Dentist Union, the British Dental Association. And Diane Ibanye Tirado is an anthropologist. She's been studying the rise in dental tourism and she opted to have emergency dental treatment abroad herself. And um, welcome both of you. Diane, tell us then, what did you have done and where? Hello, thank you for inviting me. So I, um, I had a few canal treatment in Turkey because I was struggling with, uh, with pain here and uh, couldn't get an appointment in an NHS dentist, went to a private dentist and they quoted me about £1,500 for the treatment. 
and I have already been working for as an anthropologist in, in Istanbul and was aware of the medical tourism and dental tourism, so I decided to go there. So my tooth was treated there for £80. Pounds. £80? Pounds. Yes. Goodness me, were you happy with it? Um, till now, I don't have any problem with the tooth. I guess you yes. never know, do you? So you can see, if you look at those sums, I would easily leave enough over for your flight and somewhere to stay while you get over the treatment. Uh, yes, uh, depending on the on the uh, time of the year, uh, the cost of the flights vary. But there are a lot of flights from all airports in the UK to Turkey, to Istanbul and Antalya, which are the main destinations for dental tourism. And they can be uh, very cheap. In my case, uh, two years ago, it was £350. For the flight? So, yes. Yeah. And I stayed there with the uh, with conferences. You said it was, oh, so you had no, you had no hotel costs. You said that was three yeah. years ago. And anyway, your root canal film has held up this far. Yes. Um, Paul Woodhouse, we know, don't we, that people have been going abroad for cosmetic dentistry for years now. I mean, some of those people in Manchester knew people who have done it because it can be cheaper, even if you put in the flights and hotels. But are you hearing these reports now that people are going abroad for more basic things, like Diana did, you know, for root canal fillings, to have their teeth out? Yeah, we're, we're hearing sort of increasing reports of people being forced into this situation. There was recently a little story of a, a Ukrainian refugee, someone who fled a war zone, who actually found it easier to return to Ukraine and get dental treatment there. Really? That was true? Is that true? Yeah, apparently so. Um, it's just a sort of shocking indictment of the state of NHS dentistry in this country. What do you think you should bear in mind then if you're thinking about doing this? Uh, it's well, I mean, I'm sure that there'll be quality dentists in every country in the world, and if you get a quality dentist, everything will be fine. But the, it's the kind of the quality assurance part of that. So if you see a dentist in this country, you know that person is checked and regulated by one of the most strident regulators on uh, if anything goes wrong, you've got financial redress because every dentist has to carry indemnity insurance. So, for instance, if someone places an implant and it fails to operate a fault, as opposed to yours, you are compensated for um, remedial treatments. If, if the root canal is not going to an adequate standard and it fails, you get the financial redress so you can be fixed properly by another dentist. Um, whereas, Abroad, those, those rules and regulations are, are not as strong as this country. The guarantees aren't there, and that's the, the big concern we've got about this. Diana, how did you choose your dentist? Um, because I have been working already in Istanbul and doing a little bit of research about medical tourism. Uh, I already was aware of uh, a dentist there, and uh, I went with some recommendations from, from local people I knew. Uh, but it's true that there is a great variety of, of dental clinics uh, ranging from the so-called uh, five-star hotels because they they, um, they offer packages with hotel um, uh, transfers and the dental treatment to the more local ones which are small, um, are cheaper, more affordable. Um, so for so pounds, what was the clinic like that you went to? Um, it was a local clinic, uh, not not a fancy five-star uh, one, but uh, this particular dental clinic receives a lot of um, people from the US and Europe um, and treats a lot of foreigners. And I knew people who have been there in the past three years or so and um, recommended this one. You were doing research anyway in Turkey and dental tourism. So for most people from the UK, what is the main reason for going What the, the price, they can't get an NHS dentist, what? So I have been talking to people uh, from the UK in Istanbul and Antalya and also in the UK, people who are thinking of going or have already been or are going and people who are receiving the dental treatments there. Uh, usually they uh, try to, to get treatment in the NHS but what is happening is that in a lot of places uh, the so-called dental deserts, um, there are no NHS appointments uh, or they are really long waiting lists. So people start Googling, uh, looking on the internet and um, Turkish dental clinics have developed a lot of um, 
uh, adverts to reach uh, people who are searching for dental, dental treatment. So once they find a clinic and get in contact, a lot of the um, conversation is through WhatsApp with agents uh, who offer packages, uh, who work for these clinics, and the information is one-to-one uh, -one and they offer a, an estimate of what the patient needs and also offer different hotel packages and so on. Um, and this can take up to two weeks, one week, it depends on the patient how, how uh, quick they want to be treated in Turkey. Paul Woodhouse from the British Dental Association. In Turkey, this is becoming a really big growth area for them and a great income spinner, isn't it? A great way of bringing in foreign investment to the country. You were saying, you know, that we are regulated by the stiffest regulator in the world. But aren't they trying to bring their own standards to the same as ours, to the same standards in America, so that they can sell and sell more successfully? Uh, that bit I don't know about. I have no idea how the Turkish regulation system works, but um, I, I would hope that anyone who's providing healthcare is, is regulated to the same standard that I am, because... But they'll want to be, won't they, to keep selling it? They'll have well, to be. Yeah, but that, that unfortunately that will bring costs with it. So you know, every dentist in the country, yeah. you know, the indemnity insurance we pay is multiple thousands of pounds I a see. year. Uh, the regulator, which exists purely to punish me, is. <laughs> so if I, if you, if well, I'm sure they don't see it that way, but I can no, see no, that no, the, the better you make it, the more it costs. Absolutely, yeah. If I was a cowboy dentist, you'd want me taken off off the market. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> And, and that's, that's what it's there for. Well, if you're in pain and you don't have a dentist and you really need 111, they will find you, won't they, emergency treatment. How long are people having to wait for that? Well, again, that's a very limited system because of the contract change that came in 2006. Um, emergency care was, was kind of centralised in areas and you maybe get 10 emergency appointments a night and if you're covering a, a massive population, that doesn't work. Um, the, the, the root cause of pretty much every problem in dentistry right now comes down to a, a terrible dental contract that was forced on the profession. We warned them it was a bad idea. Um, Parliament have, have criticised it in 2008 and then recently at the start of last year. And nothing's been changed in the well, patients. Well, that's not really true, is it? Because, you know, you say the problem with the current contract dentists is that does it make a distinction between simple and complicated treatments? Now, the government in England announced some changes only last month, so there'll be extra payments for seeing a patient who hasn't visited a dentist for two years. There'll be an increase of up to £50 per patient if the patient needs complicated work. There'll be a golden hello of £20,000 to dentists to work in a, a dental desert, you know, an underserved area. And they've also, the government, put an extra two and a half million more NHS appointments in in England. I mean, that must make a difference, doesn't it? Surely people will soon start to notice that. Okay, if you'll indulge me just a smidge, I'd like to pick all that apart because it's well, the I can best indulge smoke. you for a short time because obviously you've got I'll limited be very time. Quick. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, the, every dental practice is given a contract value. That's the amount of NHS money they give in a year. That £50 is coming out of that contract value. It's not extra money, it just makes the budget go quicker. The 20,000 golden hello will just move a dentist, an NHS dentist from one area to another. Nobody leaves the private sector to work for the NHS. Um, and all it will do is reduce access for patients who are seeing dentists on a routine basis because it's easier to get your UGA target and spend your contract value as you see a lot of new patients. It does not help dentists at all in any way other than spending their budget. It definitely doesn't help patients in any way, shape or form. Well, we'll it's a complete anathema. We'll come back to it. Paul Woodhouse from the British Dental Association and Diana Ivania Terrado. Thank you both for coming in and talking to us about that. Graduates who are repaying their student loans are finding that the interest being added means their debts are growing despite their repayments. There are loads of posts about this online. The terms of student loans vary depending on when they were taken out. The government has promised that no new graduates will pay back more than they owed in real terms, so that's if you take inflation into account. And graduates for a long time now have been told to think about their student debt repayments as a graduate tax rather than a loan repayment. Graduates have started getting in touch with us about it because they're worried. Here are just some of them. 
My student loan is £66,000 in debt and when I qualified a couple of years ago, I think it was 62. So I studied for four years, so when I graduated I had about £63,000 of debt. Since then, in the two years, it's up to about £68,000, even though I started with the pain. I honestly have no idea if I'll ever pay it off. It's a silly amount of mental arithmetic that someone has to do to try and decide whether or not they think they'll be able to pay it back in 30 years or not. Well, Simon has done some of the mental arithmetic is another listener, Lizzie Upton, and she also got in touch with us. Now, Lizzie graduated in 2015, and she's really alarmed at the way the interest payments are adding to her student debt. Um, Lizzie, welcome to you and yours, and thanks for getting in touch. Tell us what degree you took. Um, I did uh, economics uh, undergraduate at Newcastle University back in 2012, just a three-year uh, undergraduate degree. So when did you begin repaying the student debt, and how much was it when you started repaying? Uh, so when I finished uni, I borrowed £37,500, um, but you accrue interest whilst you study, so before I started work, that was up to £42,000. Um, so I started paying it back sort of day one of the job when I got a graduate job in 2016. So you must be well paid. You must have been well paid from the start to be paying it back from the start. Uh, yeah, I, I started on a kind of a lower graduate salary. I've, I've been quite successful. Um, I have had salary progression and career progression that time. I'd say I'm an above average earner. Um, yeah. So when you left university, you already owed 42,000. You've been paying this back since 2015. Yeah. How much do you currently owe? Where are you with it now? So I've calculated, I can look back through my account, I've basically made £18,500 worth of repayments, which seems like quite a lot in my yeah. eight years of work, yeah. and I've accrued in that time more than £21,500 in interest. So I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I've got more debt than I started with, despite making nearly £19,000 of repayments. Now the government is promising that no new graduates will pay back more than they owe in real terms, so that's if you take inflation into account. If you take inflation into account over the eight years that you've been working, where does that leave you? Do you owe more in real terms than you did or have you not done those sums? I haven't done those sums, no. I think I possibly could do that. It's been a while since um, that was sort of part of my day job, but I think I could. I think what I'm more interested in really is, is, the, is the, the forward look, so it's just you know, the 30 year period. You know, for anyone earning over that threshold, who's sort of repaying kind of for most of their career, that 30 year window. Um, you know, I looked at, I looked at people paying you know, well in excess of 110,000 pounds. That's, you know, with you know, ignore interest rate, just making that chicken away repayments. And there's no way I can pay it back in 30 years. So that's the sort of volume of repayment I'll be looking at as a kind of higher earner in, in 30 year period. So you'd have borrowed 37,500 and you would pay yeah. back 110,000 pounds over 30 years? Easily. That's if my, that's if my salary stays as is, no compression. Know, kind of inflationary linked increases or you know kind of promotions for me that's just assuming a flat line what i pay now each month is paid for for the next 22 years yeah it's pretty, pretty depressing it's not likely to happen though is it you probably will have pay rises in that time well exactly so it, yeah. for me it's, it's yeah. definitely an underestimate yeah um, Tom Allingham is a communications director at Save the Student. It's a kind of online advice and services website. And um, Tom, what would you say then to graduates, including Lizzie, who see the amount they owe in student debt ra hardly falling or rising even, and they're paying their loans back and have been for ages? Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, full sympathy. I'm also from that, that cohort that we've heard there, the, the 2012 to 2015 cohort, which was the first set of students to be on that £9,000 a year fee. So I'm in that group of people with the higher debt and the higher interest rate. But I think the important thing to know is that it isn't like a traditional debt. And that's not to say that the interest rates aren't high. And that isn't to say that the, the level of debt isn't high. But it is important to know that it doesn't operate in the same way as a traditional debt. So it does operate in many senses more like a tax. So you're only paying 9% of your earnings over a threshold. It does get cancelled after 30 years. It doesn't have an impact on the credit score. Um, you know, and because the repayments are tied to your income, whilst I'm not saying that they would be unnoticeable, they should at least be broadly speaking manageable. Lizzie and everyone who graduated between 2012 and 2022 start repaying when they earn 27,995 a year. Now they're always advised by people like you, by the Minnesota expert Paul Lewis, you know, to never settle it with a lump sum 
as you say, Philip is a tough shot of my dad. Would that still be your advice? Yes, in the majority of cases, yeah. The, the, the kind of the general thinking is, unless you are a very high earner, in which case you are likely to repay your student loan at some point, um, unless you are in that group, you basically will never be repay it within the 30 years. So there isn't really much to be gained from, from paying any of it off early. You're much better off using that money to go towards any private debt that you might have. So, you know, credit card, private loan, because those are the things that, you know, there is something to be gained from paying it off early or use that money to go towards a deposit on a house. It very, very, very rarely pays off to repay your student loan early. I said um, Paul Lewis, not Martin Lewis, who's the money-saving expert, but Paul Lewis is another money-saving expert, isn't he, from Moneybox here on Radio 4. Um, there's a new system, isn't there now, starting from September last year. What will change? Yes, so as you've already pointed out, the interest rate is now dropped. So it's essentially just RPI. So, as so that's you've the rate said, of inflation. That, the interest exactly rate has that. dropped to the rate of inflation. It was the rate of inflation plus 3%. Yes, although yeah. it is also worth noting that uh, whilst that is in theory the plan on uh, the, the arrangement on Plan 2, over the past couple of years the government has capped the interest rate on the Plan 2 loan to what they call the prevailing market rate. So, under the normal plan, It's a nice spring day today for many parts of the country. The temperatures are on the mild side, 14 or 15 degrees widening, and we could reach 16 degrees in the southwest of England. Probably some spells of sunshine for most of us. The risk of the odd 